This week, I was lucky enough to be invited to attend the governor's prayer breakfast. I went down to Dover very early Thursday morning and was in a room with every major politician in Delaware and all kinds of other people, some of whom I knew, but most of whom I didn't. I had never been to one of these before, so I didn't really know what to expect, although in a room full of politicians, of course, you expect a lot of talking, and there was indeed a lot of talking. Uh, I guess many people didn't have to be any place very early that day because we went right on past the time it was supposed to end and just kept on going. And I'll say I learned many things from this occasion, partly from looking at who was in attendance and who was not in attendance, partly from what people said, uh, the, the politicians who were not really trying to make political points, but nonetheless were making them subtly by which translation of the Bible they chose to read, read from, for instance. There were things going on there that, that were interesting, but that would perhaps be worth people of faith stopping and thinking a little bit what it means when those who control worldly power decided it might, it might be nice to have a little of the reflected glory of divine power. I, but I don't want to suggest that it was a negative thing in any way. It, it, it was, in, at its heart, a very good thing. The, the slogan for this year's Governor's Prayer Breakfast was One Delaware. And, of course, again, you could interpret that in many different ways. I'm sure there were 500 people in the room and there were 500 interpretations of what it means. But what I took away from it, what I would like to think was on everyone's heart one way or another, was that somehow... Prayer was going to build community. Prayer was going to build oneness. That's what we were there to do, was to pray. And that's what we did. And that in some way, that praying was something that was going to help build something that would be one, a, a unity in our community, a useful thing by anyone's standard. It also made me think, I wonder how it is that we build our community. What is it that we think is at the base of our community, our St. Thomas's community, or we the church with a capital C if you want to look at it that way? What is it that is building us up? There's a hint, I think, in the last two weeks of lessons. We've been hearing a lot about love last week and this week. Last week we heard in 1 John, those who do not love other people do not know God. It's a fairly strong statement. This week we hear in 1 John that we show our love for other people by the love that we have for God. So now we have both halves of the summary of the law, loving God in every way, loving your neighbor as yourself, all brought into it. And this week we get it from Jesus as well. Jesus is telling his followers that to love is in some way to be his followers and to hold it together when he's no longer with them. He's talking in part about what's about to happen to him and so why it is that he's going to no longer be immediately there in the picture with them and what they're going to have to do, but he's also talking about what's, what it's going to mean to keep on being his followers into the future. We heard a little bit of that from the bishop last week talking about how in Acts what we're seeing is the church getting its act together. The, the early church trying to figure out what it means to be the followers of Jesus as a group. It would be nice to imagine that that was something that they did 2,000 years ago. They figured it out. They passed it on to us. All we have to do is keep on doing what we're doing because they got all that figured out for us. But the reality, dear friends, is that that work, that holy work of building the community, of sustaining the community, of nurturing the community continues constantly. It never really ends. It never really stops. We are trying to get our act together as much as they were 2,000 years ago. And I want to suggest to you that what the lessons are telling us is that love is somehow what it is that enables us to do that. Love is the organizing principle of the followers of Jesus whenever we are together as a community. The Eastern Orthodox theologian John Zizula says in one of his books that Christ institutes the church, but the Spirit constitutes the church. Jesus kicked it off. Jesus got it all going. But it is the Holy Spirit, what Jesus promised to send to be with us, 
that puts meat on those bones. It enables the church to do what it is, indeed enables the church to be what it is. So something about that, that love of God, which is the Spirit of God, that, that overflows from the nature of God and pours out onto every one of us, is what we're supposed to be looking for, searching for, building up whenever we find it, attaching ourselves to whenever we find it, the better to enable the Spirit to do what God desires in each one of us and in all of us together. At that point, I could say amen and sit down, and there will be happy, those will be happy for a short sermon. It's just all about love. Go out and love, love, love. We all know what love is because we all see it all the time in, in, on TV and in every place else we look. But you know I can't do that because it's never quite that simple. Theologians have been trying to pick apart what this love thing is, what is this thing called love, for 2,000 years, probably for all of human history, if we're honest. And there are many, many kinds of love many of which are important to notice as we think about what is building our community, building it up and making it go. The first kind of love that theologians are important, I think feel is important to point out is the love of God for all of creation. God created everything as we read in Genesis and saw that it was good. God loves everything that God has made. And from that, you and I should be getting a sense of the abundance of what it is God has poured out on all of us. Now, as a church in the 21st century, whenever any preacher starts talking about abundance, the first thing we think of is money, and then property, and then human resources, and all those other things. Well, we have to have all these things. And that's true. We can't overlook the fact that that abundance is also the abundance of faith the abundance of trust, the abundance of zeal, the abundance of creativity that is poured out on all of us. If you don't believe that, just get any group of church people, any group of this congregation together and ask them, what is God trying to do now here? What does God want us to be doing now in Newark? And you won't believe the variety of answers that you get, things I would never have thought of. The abundant, the crazy abundance of what God has given to the world, given to the universe, must inform how we live as a community. It must, in many ways, make us completely and totally fearless. Then there is God's love for us, each one of us and all of us together. We all have been blessed. You can recall, I've, I've preached on this before and have kind of burst the bubble of blessing ever being just God's gold star to those of us who are good enough and so we get some reward from God. That's not what it's about. It's about getting a job. It's about God having so much faith in each one of us and all of us together that God entrusts the mission of God to us. That is what blessing is about, being told, I got a job for you. Part of being a community is recognizing how much blessing of that sort has been poured out on all of us. How often each one of us recognizes some new blessing, some new job we have been given. The most obvious and by no means the most important of these is when someone begins to feel a call to ordained ministry or to live as a religious sister or brother. But it happens in a hundred million other ways too. Every time someone sitting in this room looks around and sees someone they don't know and goes and talks to that person after church, a new blessing has been discerned and has been fulfilled. Every time any one of us sees another person in need of any sort, however small, and does something to meet that need. Yesterday I asked, asked someone if they would be willing to go wash someone else's laundry for the week. I said, yes. Nothing, nothing is so small as not to be an act of mercy, an act of love. And as a community, we, need to be, we have to be looking for those blessings. 
then there, are, there is the love that we feel for one another. From this, we discern compassion. Remember what compassion means, compassion, compassio from Latin, to suffer with other people, to feel other people's joys and sorrows so deeply that we must weep with them and celebrate with them. Can you imagine what it would be like if this community were so alive with compassion that the person who has been here once and we never saw them again, nonetheless, when something sad happens in their lives, we mourn with them. When someone we barely know has something wonderful happen in his or her life, we celebrate with them. This is the, the, the killing of the fatted calf, dear friends, for those we barely know. Can you imagine how magnetic a community like that would be? Can you imagine anybody who wouldn't want to be part of a community that was like that, that loved others so deeply as to love them in that way? And then there is the love that we feel for God, from which we discern thankfulness. There's good scientific research, dear friends, of the sort that I do in my other life, to show that if we are grateful, it's good for our mental health. If we are grateful, it better enables us to recognize the value of what it is that we have. The more grateful we are, the more grateful we become. And the better able we are to make full use of everything we have been given. As a community, we must recognize our, our need to be thankful. And then there are many, many other kinds of love. There is the love that we feel for creation. You may know that one of the main priorities of the Episcopal Church is care for creation. We don't talk about it as much as we should, but it's one thing that we believe as Christians is important, that we respect everything that God has created and take care of it as best we can. There is the love that God feels for those who are not members of our community, indeed are not members of any community of faith. That was in the lesson from the gospel last Sunday. I have sheep that are not of this fold. I have to collect them too. Periodically in our prayers of the people, we pray for those whose faith is known to God alone. How do we as a community recognize those whose faith is known to God alone. And then, perhaps the most complicated of all for most of us is the spiritually healthy love that we feel for ourselves. I can remember 25 years ago when I was just beginning to figure myself out spiritually, I would hear my bishop give his blessing anytime I was at an event where he was, and he would tell people to love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. At the time, I was tempted to just dismiss it. I, I, at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. But once I stopped and thought about it, I realized it was more difficult than I would have thought at first. There are many unhealthy ways to love ourselves. How often do we love ourselves as creatures of God? How often do we love ourselves the way God loves us? How much different would our community be if we encouraged that in one another? All of these things are both the building blocks of a faithful community and also the ways that the faithful community is revealed, the way that people can see what's going on, the signs that are unmistakable in that community. More than that, this is a useful way, I think, for each one of us to judge what's going on in all the communities that we are part of not just the church. I mean, it works for the garden club, it works for the bowling league, it works for the political party that we agree with, it works for the political party that we don't agree with. It works for absolutely every community that we go into. There's no reason to expect that every one of them is going to be thumping the Bible. That's not most of their purposes. But we should expect that any time any collection of the children of God, which is to say everybody on earth, gathers together we will see signs of the blessings of the Spirit, 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, transformation, restoration, forgiveness, all those things that are supposed to be happening among us to heal us. Where do we see those happening in the communities to which we belong? Once again, I could sit down and say amen, and that might be enough, but there is one more piece to all of this, dear friends. We hear it in just a hint that we get in the gospel this morning, this odd remark that Jesus makes in the middle of this thing about how they're supposed to love one another. He says, no one has any greater love but to lay down his or her life for his or her friend. Again, he's talking about what's about to happen to him. But it's right there in the middle of this discussion of what it's going to mean to be a Christian community. As much as we are building it, we are also called to recognize that there must always be risk. There must always be vulnerability. There must always be the potential for transformation. To love God completely is to love God more than anything else. Martin Luther had a really hard time with this. He talked in his commentary on the New Testament about how love, human love, always involves a certain element of self-interest. We're never really able to love completely the way God loves in a truly selfless way. And yet, that is what we're called to try to do. That is what we must be looking for in our community. The idea that perhaps the community itself might change, might be transformed, might die in order truly to serve God. Can you imagine that as being part of the mix? All of this, dear friends, is my challenge to you and to me this week to look for those signs of the movement of the spirit of love in this community. Where do we see it? Where can we encourage it? Where can we cultivate it? Where can we celebrate it? Where do we see that as we go through the days of our lives, the places we go, the people we meet? Everywhere, where is the presence of God? Where is the spirit of love? Where is community being built around us? Where, we, where are we being called to enter into it more deeply? Amen.